Thank you, thank you. We have a wonderful speaker today, someone that I admire a lot. Uh, she always blows me away. She's phenomenal with her intelligence and her sense of humor. She always comes up with these things that, you know, you sit and think and you think, oh my gosh, where did that come from? How does she remember all of that stuff? Anyway, Paulette Jones is a, is a beautiful, phenomenal being that I totally and completely admire and love. And her topic today is the search for the meaning of life, and I think we are all looking for that. So you're in the right place today. And I wonder if I would like to introduce Paulette Jones. Oh, hey. Thank you. Love you. Love you. Love you. And I love you guys, too. Excuse me, we're having a private moment here. God bless each and every one of you. Thank you for being here today. Today, I want to talk to you about the search for the meaning of life. That's what we're going to be talking about. And by a strange coincidence, it also happens to be the title of my talk today. So you see the universe is just kind of lining up to serve us. So we got that going for us. So beyond that, uh, as you already mentioned, we're all, we are all engaged in a search for life as evidenced by the fact that you're sitting here right now. You got up, you came here, you got dressed. Well, hopefully not in that order, but <laughs> nonetheless, here you are. Here you are in this sacred space, in this sacred place, surrounded by these sacred, sacred beings, and you have full expectations that you're going to find some meaning here. And that's a really reasonable expectation because you've done it before. You've done it before on numerous occasions. And sometimes you have come here and some new, beautifully profound truth comes into your consciousness. It comes crashing into your consciousness and it climbs up your spine and it explodes in your brain and suddenly some new cosmic piece comes together in this great cosmic puzzle we call life. And you are swept up in that moment. And in that moment, Everything slips away. The whole world slips away. All that is is you and that new piece of truth, of information, the new piece of God comes together. And all that is is that piece of information and you and the moment. The rest of the world slips away. And then the moment is over and the rest of the world comes crashing back down around our shoulders. But in that moment, it is what is very similar to what is known as a theophany, an individual experience of God, a godlike experience, a godlike experience on the physical plane. And in that very moment, it is an all consuming moment and everything slips away. It is a divine moment, that aha moment. And in that aha moment, whether you realize it or not, you feel caught up in the arms of God and you are held in the arms of divinity and you remember who you are. You remember who you are. You remember your divine origins because you've forgotten. You've forgotten who you are. And I'm here this morning to remind you, to give you a gentle, a loving, a kindly reminder of the godness that you are, of the being that you are, the oneness that you are, the divine entity that you are. You need a reminder every now and then because we forget. We descend from the divine and we take out this form and we take on this form and we get lost in the form and we forget. Don't forget. I'm here to remind you. And I am also here to invite you to participate in an inquiry, to look into the fundamental essence of the human condition, who we are at the very essence, the very core of our being, that divine spark that drives us to ask fundamental questions about who we are. Who am I? How did I get here? Where am I going? And how am I connected to God, to the universe, to my fellow beings, and to myself? Those are profoundly beautiful questions and they are they are part and parcel of who I are, who we are they at the very core of our humanity is this divine spark this divine spark and it and it, and it binds us together as one it is the fundamental essence of the human condition. And we can spend all of our time trying to find differences. Oh, how different, how unique, how different, how separate we are. And, and some cases can be built for that. 
because in certain regards we are. But at the very core of who we are is this fundamental oneness, this beauty, this majesty, this godness of who we are. But we forget. We forget that. We forget it because it's on our biology. We descend from the divine being, we take on this form, and we get lost in the form. And we mistakenly believe that somehow we are disconnected from our source, that somehow we're different, we're separate. God, I'm here and God's over there. But it's, in, it, it's okay. It's in our biology. You see what happens to us, we are victims of our biology. We come here, we descend from the divine, we become a fetus, we take on this human form, and for the first two years of our life approximately on this planet, we are unable to discern the difference between ourselves and the world around us. We're not really sure where we end and mom picks up. Open mouths of people around us are just as good a place to shove our fingers as shoving them in our mouth, because it's all one integrated thing. We don't see the differences. But something happens to our brain around the age of two. There's four major sections of our brain. We've got a frontal lobe, we've got temporal lobes on the side. In the back we have the parietal lobe, and under that is the occipital lobe. Now the occipital lobe is really powerful. It does all kinds of stuff for us. One of the things is that it's responsible for, for processing input data that we receive through our visual cortex. In other words, it allows us to see. Now that capability develops fairly quick when we are children. Actually within, well, seconds, minutes, as soon as we're born, pretty much we can see. Things are blurry a bit, but that part of the brain is already developed. But the part that isn't developed in the occipital lobe is this sense that we have of our individuality, the sense that we have of our uniqueness, the thing that separates us. So we don't see that separation when we're children. But around the age of two years, this occipital lobe begins to take on different characteristics. And suddenly, we see our separatistness. We see that we are different from the rest of the world. And we spend the rest of our lives somehow trying to get back to that source, trying to reconnect with that source. And we call that the search for the meaning of life. Now look, that search for the meaning of life is nothing new. From pretty much from the time of our, from the beginning of our time on this planet, people have stood on mountaintops and in valleys and, and, and looked up at the sky and looked in awe and amazement at this amazing dome that is just covered with with light. I, how do I make sense out of that? How am I to relate to that? Well, we did it the way human beings think. We break things into parts and we bring it back together. We reassemble it. And that's what we did with the stars. We look at these stars, we try to search some meaning, some connection to that. And so what we do is we make stuff up. We call them constellations. But we made that up. Constellations only exist in the mind of man. But we did that because we engage in what is known as deconstructive morphology. We break things up into their form. We put them back together. It's the basis of calculus. We break things up. We differentiate. We integrate. It's how humans process information. And we've been doing it for a long, long time. And in doing that, we make stuff up. And we refer to that as the search for the meaning of life. Who? What complex beings we are, huh? <laughs> Why do we do all that stuff? Because we're trying to cope, we're trying to understand, we're trying to understand how we are connected to the one. And we look in many, many different areas. Many people turn to religion as an example because they think that somehow religion gives us answers for, for reconciling our, our divinity with our humanity. Somehow we think we can pull those pieces together. And so we're all asking pretty much the same kind of questions, but as it turns out, we're getting decidedly different answers. How does that happen? The Buddha, as an example, the Buddha will tell you that a meaningful life can be found in the elimination of suffering. And that the elimination of suffering comes when we release attachment to things that we want and we don't have, 
And when we release attachment, we, you know, a, a, a repulsion to things that we have and we want to get rid of, we are upset, we are unhappy, and that causes unhappiness, that causes suffering. Now the suffering, according to the Buddha, the first thing that the Buddha did when he emerged from his meditation under the Bodhi tree at Bodh Gaya some 2600 years ago, was he wrote something called the Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutra. Everybody together, that's the title of a song, isn't it? <laughs> Dhammachakapavatana Sutra. It is the first sutra, and a sutra is nothing more than a discussion. It is, think of it that way, a, a thread, a discussion. And the first one was about the Four Noble Truths, about the Four Noble Truths, the truth of suffering, the truth of the source of suffering, the truth of the end of suffering, and the truth of the path to the end of suffering, the Eightfold Path of Enlightenment. The Hindu teaching tells us that the meaning of life can be found in the great moral teaching of the Bhagavad Gita. Here we have the Lord Krishna talking to the General Arjuna on the sacred field of Kuru, the sacred field of duty. And, and Krishna tells Lord Arjuna that there's a hidden dimension of the universe and that that hidden dimension of the universe is only accessible by means of discipline. Yoga. We think of yoga as moving your, your body in all kinds of weird positions till it hurts. So, right? But, but yoga is really discipline. So the Lord Krishna tells the general Arjuna that how we get meaning out of life is through discipline. And there's three major kinds. Karma, yoga, which is action. Yana yoga, which is knowledge or wisdom. And, and bhakti yoga, which is devotion. And that if we live our lives in the understanding that the universe is one seamless, integrated, divine being, and we find our place in that universe, then we can find meaning in life by observing our sacred honor and by behaving as though every act we take is an act of devotion to God. And that gives life to the Hindu, that gives meaning to the Hindu life. Christians will tell you that the meaning of life can be found by accepting Jesus Christ as your savior and by understanding that he is the, in, the incarnation of the God of the Jews and that he will establish his kingdom on this earth. Now, the Bible refers to both the kingdom of God and the, hev and the, and the, uh, uh, the kingdom of heaven on this earth. And there's a significant amount of discussion and argument about what Jesus really mean when he spoke about that. But virtually all Christians agree that is something that he intends to establish, will be established on this earth, a kingdom where peace and justice reigns, and that the hope for that kingdom gives life to, a, gives meaning to a Christian life. Islam will tell you that the meaning of life can be found in submission to the will of Allah and in looking forward to the day when all the world will be united in peace Salam, from which the word Islam comes. Salam, it will be reunited in peace uh, in both the, uh, the vertical, that's between human beings and God, and between the horizontal, between all people. And that, that hope for the for uh, a peaceful, united world gives meaning to Islam, gives meaning to an Islamic life. The, the Greeks now had a different perspective on what the meaning of life is. The Greeks were an amazing experience. The, the, the mo one of the most amazing things about the Greek experience was that they took human beings, mankind, and placed them at the very center of the universe. And from that perspective, they created the gods, and they looked just like us. <laughs> There's Zeus sitting right here, after all. <laughs> he showed up came to us from Olympus. They look just like us, and that was unique in the ancient world. That had never happened before. The gods, that, and the that monstrous kind of gods that were worshipped elsewhere in the world were nowhere to be found on Olympus and were nowhere to be found in the Greek experience. But the kicker, the, the major thing about the Greek meaning of life was that there was no central controlling authority on matters of truth. Truth, then, 
is an individual matter. It is something for individuals to decide of themselves. And that central idea gave birth to Greek philosophy, which of course gave birth to Western philosophy. Isn't that extraordinary? You know, for my own search for truth, I have looked on many paths and over the course of the last, I don't know, four or five years, I have studied and taught quantum physics, Einstein's theories of relativity, calculus. I've gone back to study a whole bunch of things, history, philosophy, psychology, great world religions, great world teachings, literature, all kinds of things. And why? So that I can reteach it. And why do I want to reteach it? So I can learn it. Why do I want to learn it? Because I'm trying to put together the pieces of those puzzles and find out where really is the meaning of life. The meaning of life is all over the place. The, and and the, herein is the key. Here's where we're getting to. You know, the meaning of life is not a destination. It is a journey. One never arrives at the meaning of life. One never arrives and said, hey, I know the meaning of life. I can go on vacation now and just kind of hang out. No. The meaning of life is really about living in the question of life, the great questions of life. You know, I don't think, I don't know that anyone ever really can answer the question, what is the meaning of life? That question, I think, is, is more for living in the question rather than expecting an answer to that. Everything has meaning in life, but it has meaning in life based upon how we look at it. You know, I think, I think, Occasionally, I think. I think of this, this, what comes to mind is this statue I see in Forest Lawn in Glendale, and it is called The Meaning of Life. And you have this marvelous statuary outside of a garden, and it features a river, like a stream, metaphorically the river of life, the stream of life. And gathered around it are perhaps a dozen or so characters, and each of them is staring at this river of life, wanting to understand the meaning of life. What is the mystery of life? And the answers come depending upon the questions that are posed and depending upon our expectations. We see the expectations of the young lovers embraced. And, the, and you can see the looks on their faces that for them the meaning of life comes in that embrace. We see an old seer, an ancient sage, and you can see the look on his face that for him the meaning of life comes in internal processes to understand that. And then there is the fool who sits there and giggles and doesn't even care what the meaning of life is. We don't have any of those. But all of those types, what that really tells us, that the way we live life is to live life in the mystery, in the question. And don't ever expect to really get an answer about what the meaning of life is. And now if you really want to find out what the meaning of life is, go watch the Monty Python film called The Meaning of Life. Did anybody ever see that? The meaning of life for about an hour and a half will be uproarious giggles. But today we're concerned with other things. Today we're concerned with other aspects of the meaning of life. And for me, I can only be concerned with my own search for the meaning of life. Today I'm here sharing some perspectives with you. For me, I have a lot of respect for the way the Greeks approached the meaning of life. That the, 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 there is no central controlling authority on matters of truth and that it's up for each of us to decide what the truth is for us. And in that process, while we search for our own truth, we are engaging in the meaning of life. We are adding to the meaning of life because the meaning of life is that question. And we do it here on Sunday mornings. We come together as one in this sacred, sacred community here. And in that, we come closer to the steps to understand what the real meaning of life is all about. I think we come here, we come here with a common purpose. We want to feel good. We want to understand more about, about the universe, and we want to do that by practicing love. And that's what we're all about. We are a loving, inclusive community. You know, I have spent, I have spent so much of my life trying to live other people's truths. 
I have spent so much of my life walking on paths that were not designed to optimize my search for meaning in life until I finally came to the realization that I cannot. I cannot walk on anyone's other's, any other's path. I cannot live anyone else's truth. The truth of my life is my life to be lived. And I live it in the truth of who I am. And I openly embrace the, the changes that are coming in my life that will create the being that I am about to become. That is a life well worth lived. And I think, I think of the author Khalil Gibran, who said, we should come together and raise our hands to the giver. So we come here together in this beautiful space in this morning, and we raise our hands to the giver, and we come together in love, and that gives meaning to our lives. Namaste. God bless each and every one of you. Thank you.